In today's video, we are talking about cancer tumor markers, and this is a very uh, vast field. There's a lot of research being done in it, but today we're going to talk to Dr. Mark Schulz. He's a 30-year medical oncologist who is focused solely on prostate cancer, and we're going to talk about the information that these markers can give us and the options you can have from that information. In today's video, we're talking about tumor markers, and these are different markers that these tumors give off and these cancers give off inside the prostate and around the body when they have uh, metastatic activity. Now, there's a lot of complicated terms in prostate cancer, and I always feel for these patients and when they're learning about this because you're already having to learn about your specific type of disease, but then you hear things like, you know, CEA and, you know, circulating tumor DNA, and it just gets so complicated. And But a lot of this information leads to determining treatment that would be effective for your particular type of cancer. So how do, um, can you just go through the list of what these are? And then we can kind of go through what the treatments would be based off that list. Well, the context for this sort of thing is for men that have metastatic hormone-resistant prostate cancer. I get sometimes questions from men with early-stage prostate cancer about these exotic tumor markers and concerns. Maybe they've, someone's decided to test them in the blood, and they're a little bit out of uh, range. Early stage prostate cancer is not the issue. It's when men develop metastasis and they have multiple lesions throughout their body, these different metastases can actually diverge genetically, where some of the metastases may be responding to the existing treatment, where others may not. You get a divergence, and this ideally is something that people want to detect. The problem with very advanced prostate cancers is that PSA may become less accurate. Historically, we've relied heavily on PSA. If it's rising, that's a sign that the cancer is uncontrolled. It's time to change treatment to try something different. If the PSA is declining, that's a sign that the cancer is responding and keep going with what you're doing. And this process of deciding how long to stay on a treatment is heavily based on whether we think the treatment is continuing to work. And if PSA was 100% accurate, we wouldn't need any of these other tests. Of course, now we have PSMA PET scans, which further aid in determining if the cancer is growing or regressing. But we do also know, just as PSA can become advanced disease, sometimes PSMA is not lighting up in metastatic lesions either. So there are a number of other substances that are released into the bloodstream by these cancer cells, and uh, I'll just list a few of them. Prostatic acid phosphatase, so-called PAP, LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, which is a nonspecific inflammatory marker. Uh, there are other inflammatory things like uh, C-reactive protein. These are nonspecific, but if they're rising, it's a, it does give a sense that something is moving forward or growing or is not controlled. Uh, other markers would be like uh, for small cell markers, uh, chromogranin A, CGA, uh, neuron-specific enolase, NSE, uh, CEA, which is a marker usually thought of for colon cancer, but some variants of prostate cancer start making CEA, and if you test it in the blood and it's elevated, that becomes a valid marker, just like PSA. If it's rising, that suggests that the cancer is not being completely controlled by the existing treatment protocol. Prostatic acid phosphatase is an old-fashioned PSA, PAP, and that also can track if it's rising, suggesting that growth is not being controlled. Beyond those, we have uh, circulating free cancer-related DNA in the bloodstream, uh, which can be detected genetically. These are very accurate at very small amounts, and they can quantify how much cancer DNA is in the bloodstream with companies like Foundation One, uh, Garden360, or Keras. Uh, these can be checked sequentially to look for response and regression. So I know I've listed a lot of stuff, but we're sort of ambiguous as to how much the existing protocol, let's say someone's on taxotere chemotherapy, and their PSA levels off. It started at 80, and now it's down to 20, and you know, the patient is getting every Q3 week uh, injections. Should the chemotherapy be continued? Should it be discontinued? Well, if the doctors had ordered some of these tests at baseline, and then retested them to see if they're continuing to decline. Alkaline phosphatase perhaps should have been mentioned first. That's a nonspecific enzyme that comes from the bone. Prostate cancer is often in the bones at this stage, and that should be declining if there is a continued response. If there's a panoply of these markers that are available at baseline and then check sequentially over time every month or two to see if they all are declining, that gives a lot of peace of mind that the chemotherapy, for example, which does have side effects, is justified and continuing to give a successful outcome. If you're 
looking at a situation where these markers are in a mixed sense, then perhaps it's time to start looking for other perhaps non-PSA producing cancers, PET scan negative cancers, to make sure that something isn't being missed in the weeds where we just, oh, the PSA is fine, but is the disease truly controlled? I'm gonna ask some contextual questions really quick before we get into the specifics of those. So are these types of markers determined by blood or tissue samples? So they're all blood tests. Is it a one-time thing where you take their, you know, you take the patient's blood and then they're going to be, um, you know, checking these baseline markers? Does every medical oncologist do this once you're in a, you know, non-hormone sensitive state now? Unfortunately, they don't. Someone has to think ahead. If uh, we're dealing with a patient who has advanced metastatic prostate cancer, let's say they're starting on taxotere chemotherapy, the initial thing is to give two treatments and see if the PSA stabilizes, presumably, it was rising before uh, or even starts to decline. But if there's greater precision being exercised, these other blood tests can all be done before the taxotere is started, just as you start with a baseline PSA. And then they can be repeated every 30 to 60 days to see if they're declining. As the cancer cells die off, they should be producing fewer and fewer of these blood markers. Therefore, the levels in the blood should be declining. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September we have an in-person conference for patients and caregivers, and it's a great way to get your questions answered. You can learn more at pcri.org forward slash conference. Now don't forget to click that subscribe button because we come out with new prostate cancer videos every week, and if you'd like to support us financially, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. So with these markers, if it's not a common thing that a medical oncologist is going to do, does that mean that every advanced patient needs to go into their doctor's appointments and ask for these um, you know, markers to be done, this blood to be taken, and they need to do this at every appointment so that they themselves can track it? It is something you should bring to the attention of your medical oncologist. If you're uh, implementing treatment with an advanced disease, maybe you're taking Pluvicto or Taxotere, maybe you're on Linparza, one of these PARP inhibitors, where we're not expecting, as we are with hormone therapy, that the PSA is going to go down to less than 0.1. That'd be great if it does, but so often when we're wrestling against these more advanced cancers, we're hoping for stabilization, regression, but complete control is not common. So deciding that inflection point of when have we extracted the benefit from the taxotere and when's the time to move on to Plavicto is uh, sometimes an art form. And the more information that doctors have at their fingertips in terms of the ongoing benefit signaled through these markers continuing to decline gives doctors and patients more confidence that they're making the right choices. So when it comes to these different types of treatments and these markers that we see, you know, can any of these markers, you know, determine which treatment you should get, or is this really just how effective the treatment's being and knowing when to switch? I'm not talking about doing tumor markers beyond PSA necessarily to help select treatment. That's a different process. For example, using Limparza, you want to do genetic testing to see if you've got BRCA mutations indicating that Limparza is more likely to work. The ambiguity surrounded with uh, whether the treatment that you've initiated is continuing to really benefit you or not. One of the problems I see in observing oncologic behavior for men with advanced disease is patients are told, okay, we're gonna start you on taxotere, you're gonna get six treatments. We're gonna start you on pluvector, you're gonna get six treatments. Seemingly assuming that it's always gonna to continue to be effective for six treatments, which is clearly not true. The idea of giving ineffective treatment beyond where you've tested the waters to find out if it's effective. Usually it takes two injections of taxotere, or two injections of Plavicto for to see an inflection in what was previously a, a rising PSA. The idea that you just charge ahead and just keep giving the treatment without trying to ascertain how much good it's accomplishing seems ridiculous. These treatments are very effective in more than half the patients, but unfortunately they're not effective in everybody. And giving an ineffective treatment is just allowing the cancer to progress when they could be switching to another agent, which will help. There are two markers, CGA and NSE, that can detect small cell variants of these types of you know, prostate cancers. And that's good information to know because you can get very um, precise, and this is what they call precision medicine, and how you, know, you can select treatments for these types of things. So what type of treatments would be available if those are positive? So CGA and NSE are purported indicators of a small cell variant, a condition that uh, usually only surfaces in very advanced resistant types of cancers, but it's good to detect it because there is one type of chemotherapy called carboplatin, which is pretty effective in those people. Problem is, is that 
Just because CGA and NSE are elevated a little bit doesn't necessarily mean that small cell prostate cancer is present, but it is something that can be tested for because in many cases, these small cell variants are going to be PSMA negative. And patients who are re have resistant cancers, PSAs are rising, CGA and NSE are elevated, then that is a time to be thinking about a chemotherapy called carboplatin that can be very effective against small cell variants. Confirming unequivocally that small cell cancer is present is not accomplished simply by having elevated blood markers. It may be necessary to do a needle biopsy of a lesion. Additional scans like FDG PET scans, not PSMA PET scans, may detect small cell variants where a PSMA PET scan might miss it. It is important to detect it because small cell variants are aggressive, they grow quickly. You need to intervene with these more uh, specific types of chemotherapy, such as carboplatin, to hope to keep them under control. You know, when we hear these terms like tumor markers and all these different letter combinations and circulating tumor DNA, it can kind of become overwhelming. There's a lot of information, but you know, if you take the time to get your blood drawn, find out what your levels are, and then one by one go through those, something even like ChatGPT, which we don't, you know, um, we don't have any ownership of, but they do a really great job of just breaking down simple terms. So I would encourage you, you know, if you need to look at these individual terms and understand them based off of your case. There's a lot of information on the internet. We're gonna be posting some great breakdowns on our website, and we'll go ahead and link that in the comment section below. But also ChatGPT is a really great form to uh, you know, look at those different terms and say, well, how is this meaningful to me and what treatments would you base this marker off of? It has been a great tool for me as I've done some research in this area. Also, another great tool is some talks that we have on these particular topics with Dr. Eugene Kwan, and we're gonna link those in the comment section below as well. Now, I would encourage you, if your doctor is not talking about getting these different markers done through your blood and, you know, go ahead and ask for that blood test. Advocate for yourself. Say, hey, you know, I heard about this on a video. I just want to know if it would be helpful to determine whether or not my treatment is being effective. You know, how do we put this information in the context of my specific case? And even though that can be a daunting aspect to kind of say, well, they're the medical oncologist. How do I do this? I would really encourage you because it's one of those things like you want to know as much time ahead of time as possible whether these treatments are working and are being effective and you want to know what the game plan is for the next step and what the next thing would be after that and this can kind of help guide the conversation so that you can know ahead of time what are the treatments i'm looking at what am i looking for as far as these markers go how should the psa act what should the scans look like and all of this is just more context so that you can put those puzzle pieces together to make that whole picture. Um, and a lot of times this helps with mental health, this helps with emotional health, just to know what the game plan is ahead of time. And it gives people a lot of hope. The great thing in prostate cancer is there is a lot of different treatments and we're starting to see, you know, different types of immune therapies come into prostate from other types of cancers. There's a lot happening in these pipelines from these companies. And it's good to know that um, the more information you have, sometimes if you just know ahead of time, hey, I'm positive for this marker, and a treatment comes along recently, hey, this you're actually eligible for this treatment, it's good to have that information ahead of time. I've seen this with patients in real time, where they went ahead and they just got these tests, nothing was on the market, something got approved, and they were able to take it because they had that information in their pocket and their medical oncologist was able to guide them through that process. Now, if you need help with your specific case and you would like more information, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been trained by our medical oncology advisory team, and they just do a great job of contextualizing your specific case so that you can go into those doctor's appointments feeling empowered, feeling like you're getting your questions answered. And most of all, we want to make you feel like you're not alone. Helpline's here for you. The support groups, we're going to list them in the comments section below. You're not alone. There's a lot of really great supportive resources especially in advanced care. And I would really encourage you to go to Health Unlocked and look at the advanced disease category. You can ask questions on there. And a lot of patients come in and answer based off of their experiences. All of these are great resources for you. If you have specific questions, please leave them in the comment section below this video. Please have a great week and hope you know that we really care about you. We want you to know that you are important. And yes, this is a hard journey, but we're here for you. Thank you so much for watching this video.